Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about how to read the photograph and in particular we're going to use some examples of, from uh, early Italian photography to put this, uh, put this in practice. I included some, uh, um, some interactive bits, I'm going to ask some questions uh, to comment uh, um, to comment on some of the images I'm showing. So if you want uh, um, if you want to engage, just uh, unmute and uh, um, and answer as soon as I um, as soon as I ask. No need to raise your hand or write it in the chat if you want to. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes after each question in case someone wants to chip in, and then we're going to comment together. Now, uh, what does it mean? First of all, to read a photograph. Uh, surely not all photographs have a text in them that can be read. So uh, what does it mean that, um, what does it mean that we can read a photograph? What does it mean to treat a photograph like a text? Well, we should ask ourselves, what is a text to begin with? Now, this is a text. Of course, the thank you very much. What does it mean? It means that a text is a set of conventional signs that, simply put, make sense when they are pieced together. And if we treat a picture as a text, it means that we can consider a picture as an entity, something that is made of discrete elements that when put together, form a picture and make sense. Or the other way around, they convey a meaning. They make sense for us or they convey a meaning for someone else or both, normally it is both. Therefore, to read a picture means that we must recognize the language in which that picture, that text is written the language that it expresses. We have to understand its grammar and syntax, that is to say the formal rules that uh, allow all the different pieces of the, um, of the picture to come together and make sense. And also, we have to understand the relationship that this text, this picture, has with other texts, with other pictures. Its intertextual dimension, the relationship that the picture has with visual culture with other pictures, with the imagery of, uh, of a culture. This means that we have to acquire a certain visual literacy, the ability to derive meaning from images of everything that we see, to read and sometimes even to write visual language. However, of course, and the, the blurb, the abstract for this, um, the abstract for this um, webinar um, mentioned it, we are immersed in pictures. From when I open my eyes to when I go to sleep, I am probably exposed to more pictures than someone 200 years ago would have been in a lifetime. We are surrounded by pictures, we take pictures, we, sh we see pictures of each other, and we are so immersed in them that we are anesthetized to them. We don't pay that much attention. We are not uh, reading any of those pictures. We are just sort of skimming through them. It's just visual information. It's not even visual information, it's visual noise to a certain extent. So, this was a problem, this was something that photography was accused of ever since its very inception. As Sontag put it in 1970, humankind lingers unregeneratively in Plato's cave, still reveling its age-old habit in mere images of the truth. She's referring to the myth um, of Plato's cave, I'm not going to go into that. But being educated by photographs, which we are, is not like being educated by older, more artisanal images. For one thing, there are a great many more images around claiming our attention. The inventory started in 1839. 1839 is considered the, uh, the first, uh, um, when, when photography was announced, I'm gonna say 
a word about this. And since then, just about everything has been photographed, or so it seems. This very insatiability of the photographing eye changes the terms of confinement in the cave, in the confinement in our world. In teaching as a new visual code, photographs alter and enlarge our notions of what is worth looking at and what we have the right to observe. They are a grammar, and even more importantly, an ethics of seeing. So we are surrounded by pictures. We are over, uh, over constantly exposed to pictures. Uh, to claim to be visually literate, to acquire visual literacy means to acquire a critical response to images. That is to say, to reclaim an attentive gaze to images, to grasp their deep meaning, to be able to read these images. Because since its very inception, as I mentioned, photography was accused of polluting the world with images. And indeed, we might impute to photography that it might have encouraged a distracted gaze, but just by the sheer volume of images that uh, can reach rather relatively cheaply uh, any one person at, uh, at a time. So there are countless methods to read the photographs, to read the images, uh, but uh, um, and unknown is the perfect one. Uh, one of the main ideas that I think is very productive in terms of understanding what a pictures what a picture means to a culture is um, using the four sites of uh, a critical visual methodology as discussed by uh, by Rose. Now we have a picture here. This is a picture by famous Italian photographer Gianni Berengo Gardin. Um, it's the picture of a kiss uh, and we would know from the caption had they shown it that it's in the streets of Paris in some, something like the 1960s. And here we have an image of uh, the professional photographer who took it, Gianni Berengo Gardin. Um, of course, the picture is not the picture of him taking this picture exactly, but just a picture of him taking a picture. Now, the picture itself, according to Rose, is the site of the image itself. But the site of the image itself is simply put what we're looking at. What are we looking at? It's uh, an image of a kiss, it's in black and white, it's been, uh, uh, it's in black and white, it's probably been taken um, in the 1960s, we would know if we saw the, the caption, there is a blurred tram probably, uh, or, or bus in, in, in the background, um, maybe we could stretch it a little bit more and say that uh, given the year it was taken, it might show a, a change of habits, a change of costumes, a change of uh, public display of affection, for instance, of what was deemed acceptable and how in the 1960s it, uh, our habits changed, our perception of, uh, um, of public displays of affection changed. So that's the image itself, the content of the image itself. But of course, this image has been taken by someone, someone who at, at a certain point was um, at a certain point was passing by um, and decided to take a picture of that scene that he or she was seeing. And now this person has been influenced by certain practices of looking, certain cultural models, and might be obsessed with certain themes. Gianni Berengo Gardin um, published a collection of photographs of kisses, actually. Um, they might be interested in certain themes, they might, their culture might push them to investigate certain visual, uh, visual aspects of that culture or for another culture, for instance. But the photographer, him or herself, is also using a technological device, which is not insignificant. This is the site of production, according to, uh, according to Rose, where the photographer's eye and, and psychology... Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having a private, uh, private message. Uh, yes. Uh, 
um, the site of production is uh, where is where the image um, comes into being. It's where technology allows an image to be taken, but at, at, a, at the same time exerts certain limits. It, it gives possibilities, but it also exerts certain limits. So Gianni Berengo Gardin would have shot this in the 1960s on a black and white 35 millimeters film roll with a, uh, with a certain speed, so it's in broad daylight. Night images might have been more difficult to capture. Uh, action is captured, but there is a little bit of a motion blur. Uh, he usually shot with wide angle lenses, so he was relatively close to the subject, even though he wanted to show quite a bit of the background. So these are considerations you, we can do in terms of the site of production. The content of the image and the photographer, the, the one who produces it, are very close. But at the same time, you know, I take, a, I take out my phone, I take a selfie. Um, I take a selfie of myself, and put it in the phone, put it back in the pocket and it stays there. I take a picture with a 35 millimeter camera, I could just take the roll and put it in a drawer and everybody forgets about it. Look at what happened with Vivian Meyer. Uh, her photographs have been discovered um, years after, after she was dead. So if an image doesn't circulate somehow, it's, it's, improbable, it's improbable at the very least that it would make sense. Now, this is the site of circulation, according to Rose, and it includes everything from where it is printed to why it is printed. Uh, where it is printed, we will see some images from early Italian photography where there were issues in terms of mechanical reproduction. You could take a picture, but you could not really reproduce it as you would now, just printing it out. It was a slate of metal, quite heavy slate of metal, that you could hang at home, but you couldn't print and, uh, and show to other people. So, there are ways of printing pictures that constitute a limit to how much a photograph can circulate. But at the, at the same time, these limits are possibilities, possibilities of circulation to different audiences, to different markets, to different interested parties. And of course, finally, circulation would be meaningless if it were not for reaching an audience. And this is the site of audiencing, according to Rose. So who consumes the image? Who receives this image? Who reads this image? Who looks at this image? What does it mean for them? What does the photographer want for them to understand from that image? Everything I have said so far, all these four different sites are related to one another. So, of course, the audience dictates the practices of looking, uh, the photographer's practices of looking. After all, a photographer can be as, um, as um, original, as uh, proficient as possible, but if their images don't sell, don't appeal to an audience, they won't make a profession out of, uh, out of photography. They have to reach a market, maybe the fine art market, maybe the photojournalism market, and then there are topics that interest more, the sell better, and so forth. Practices of looking are influenced reciprocally by the audience and by the photographer. At the same time, of course, they influence what sort of content has been, uh, is captured, what sort of content tickles one's imagination. And the audience would request uh, some content, and at the same time, that certain things can be photographed, such as a kiss in public in this case, would influence the audience themselves, would influence the way they perceive certain things, would be part of a certain cultural movement. The limits of production are also, um, also influence the limits of, uh, of of printing and, and circulation. Certainly war photography, war reportage wasn't physically possible until after the First World War. Before that, war reportage photography was landscape photography really. 
and we see something about that. Um, and then again, knowing how an image circulates, will it, be, will it be printed on a huge poster? Will it be printed on a double-decker bus? Or will it be printed in a small pocketable card? Influences the way in which uh, a photographer grabs an image and the way it is produced. So a simple image is a very complex space very charged with uh, meaning and with uh, potentials for being uh, for being read and for being understood and of course this applies to any image we could look at illuminated manuscript in uh, um, in the middle ages look at an image and say okay we look at the site of the image itself at the site of production uh, a monk uh, um, a monk using certain uh, certain colors taken from certain materials. Uh, we will we would look at the site of circulation, a single copy of the Bible done in a couple of years time that circulates to an audience, uh, a feudal lord maybe, for his private library. Would be more limited, but it could apply to anything. Conveniently, we're looking only at photographs, and we're looking at photographs because photo photography was officially born around the same time when Italy became a unified country. So it's very convenient for, uh, for a scholar in, in the field of Italian studies to focus on photography as, um, as the novel medium that uh, um, represents, depicts, portrays Italy in the making. But before we begin, do you know what a photograph is? Does anyone want to venture a hypothesis? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the answer. It's much, silence is much more, much more silent in, during an online presentation than in, in a classroom. Therefore, I'm gonna give you the answer. What is a photograph? Photography means to draw, graphe, to write, with light, fos. And it is a combination at the, at the very bare minimum of photography, it is a combination of two things. A surface that is sensitive to light and a thing, let's call it a thing, that is called a camera obscura. And whether we're talking about the huge daguerreotype sort of things um, of, the, um, of the 19th century or our mobile phones with the camera in here, we're talking about the same thing. In here, there is a surface that's sensitive to light, and there is a very, very tiny, very, very mini miniaturized camera obscura. It's very tiny, I agree, and the surface sensitive to light is a digital sensor, but at the end of the day, that's what there is inside my camera phone. First of all, the sensitive material. Chemicals sensitive to light have always been known. Pythagoras talks about them in ancient Greece. There are silver salts, silver chloride, bitumen, now digital material, digital sensors, but at the end of the day, they're basically chemicals that react to exposure to light. And they react in the most normal way possible. They burn, they, they, they become black. Um, the only issue with these is that they were not strong enough to, to react to pale light, so you had to expose them to the sun, and therefore you had no way of actually getting an image on top of this sensitive material. So you had the sensitive material, but it was not sensitive enough. You had to actually put something on it, and what you obtained was that the paper would burn around uh, the places where there is no shade. Like in this case, uh, Niepce's oldest surviving heliograph, um, an etching that was put on top of a sensitized piece of paper and exposed, exposed to light. Also, they were not stable. The moment you removed the shade, that part kept burning, so you could look at it for uh, not a very long time. This is a 
fixated um, heliograph, so it's more or less stable. It was not a very convenient way, it was just better to draw stuff or to etch it. And then the camera obscura, another thing that was known since antiquity. Basically, it, it is also called a pinhole camera. You can, you can do it yourselves. If you take any dark cube or a completely dark room and you poke a hole on one surface, as you can see in this image, you, will, you would see projected upside down on the wall opposite the hole, the image that's, out, that's outside of the camera obscura. And when you combine this with a mirror, you get a drawing aid. You can just outline what you see, what is projected from below um, by, the, uh, by the mirror. Now, the invention of photography, photography is invented at the moment someone, Daguerre in particular, put a sensitized piece of paper here and automatically burnt that, burnt into that sensitized piece of paper the light that was coming through here, which was a scene, an inverted scene. So, this is the very first surviving photograph. It was taken in the 1920s, probably 1927, and it is um, an oil-treated bitumen plate that was exposed for eight hours in front of uh, Niepce's window. Eight hours to get that image. Now, with the, the mobile phones that we have in, in our pockets every day, we can take in a fraction of a second images that are probably a million times better than this one. This is how much photography evolved, but that's the very first surviving photograph. Around 1839, Daguerre announced to the world that he had invented photograph, photography. At the same time, Talbot in the UK was developing a similar method. The Daguerre uh, patented the so-called daguerreotype, because he was a bit of a narcissist and wanted his name on that which was basically a metallic a silver plate, which was sensitized with iodine and halogen fumes, uh, which was exposed in a camera obscura, was developed in vapors of heated mercury. Imagine how unhealthy that was and how portable that was, a slate of silver that you had to expose to boiling mercury. And then it was desensitized, fixed by sodium, which was the least part. Uh, what you got was basically a mirror in which the image was burnt into. Talbot instead uh, patented the calotype, which is more similar to the negatives that we have. A, a smaller piece of paper that's translucent, translucent and through which you can shine light and create copies. Now, there's not many differences. You see on the left, uh, the closest thing that we can see on screen of a daguerreotype. Again, it's more like looking at, a, looking at an engraved mirror, looking at a daguerreotype. And on the right, we see the negative of, uh, uh, of a color type. Both images are taken from Italy. These were the very two first uh, um, methods commercially available methods to, uh, to take pictures. In 1839, when Daguerre announced to the world the invention of photography, Italy was not a country. It was a series of uh, scattered states, some of them under foreign control, such as the Northeast, some of them under um, the control of the Pope. Uh, some of them were independent, but were cushion states to France, for instance, the Kingdom of Piedmont and Sardinia. So it was not, when we talk about early Italian photography, we're talking about photography that was taken by or in a country that was in the making. I'm gonna show you some daguerreotypes and calotypes of early Italy. And I'm going to just show them to you briefly. 
and uh, without the authors. And if you if you want to tell me, if you have an idea, what do you think they all have in common? It can be something about the images themselves. It can be about um, the people who took them, for instance. Whatever jumps to you, um, to your eyes. So here we have uh, um, a, an image of the Janus Arch uh, by Pierre Ambrose Richbour. It's a daguerreotype taken in the 1850s. Here we have a couple of uh, panoramic images by Giraud de Pranger, um, taken in uh, taken in Rome. He produced more than a thousand daguerreotypes in his uh, during his career, and those are taken in 1840 to 1845. We have two British photographers, John Ruskin and John Hobbs who took daguerreotypes, um, focusing mostly on architectural detail. Here we have uh, details in Venice. And finally, another, Brit uh, another Briton, Richard Calvert Jones, a member of Talbot Circle, who took calotypes, not daguerreotypes, of, uh, of Italy. So um, I'll just leave it a minute if someone wants to comment. What do you think these images have in common? Hi, this is Tatiana. To yeah, me, Tatiana, they hi. seem, hi, they seem uh, maybe because I am Italian as well, mm -hmm. um, the kind of uh, images of the typical Italian, Italianity. So mm -hmm. with the ruins uh, and uh, in the last one, uh, the statue of the, uh, one of the statues there, of a, mm -hmm. uh, probably a Roman emperor or something like that. So the typical Italian um, side that you would visit during the Grand Tour. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. You, you mentioned the, the key word here. So it's typical sites of, of the Grand Tour. So who took these pictures? Artist of uh, um, usually uh, I would say German or a Dutch or English uh, uh, wealthy young men who uh, went to Italy and then to Greece uh, and uh, other places to study the antiquity. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, oh, and what what were they doing in in Italy in uh, in Greece? Uh, in going around doing what you called quite rightly the grand tour what were they doing what do you think they were doing you know maybe others have uh, answers i, I oh, am yeah, or, no no i'm just I, I, i'm I, i'm just uh, asking if uh, mm -hmm. if anyone has an idea of who they might have been. You, you're right. I mean, they were artists. They were, um, they were photographers. They were very passionate about photography, and they were rich. Definitely, they were rich. It was not easy. It's not, it was not particularly accessible to travel. Mm. It was not the Ryanair era. Definitely. Still, even though it was not the Ryanair era, they were tourists, and that's. Uh, what characterizes these images. They were all taken by foreigners. Uh, this is a very long wall of text, but I'm going to just summarize it. It is in the, in the mirror of the Grand Tour that Italy starts to grow an awareness of being a unified country, of what uh, the territory had in common, through the lens of foreign travelers who catalogued accumulated, put together a collection of Italian sites of the places of, uh, um, of Italy. As a matter of fact, the very first I Italian name that we see is Luigi, uh, Luigi Sacchi, who in 1852-1855 publishes a, a very similar uh, collection of images but tries to publish them uh, low cost to beat the French publications Grand Tour style to, for the first time, 
um, create a sense of Italianicity for Italians themselves. And again, we're talking about the era when the first independence war were raging, so Italy was not yet considered a unified country. Photography is suitable for the diffusion of Italian art and the consequent growth of nationalist sentiments, as Pellizzari put it. And again, Sacchi's photos were not particularly. There's not much to say. I mean, they are very similar to the other pictures. What counts is the way in which these pictures were circulated and what sort of meaning that circulation wanted to, uh, to take in the eyes of the photographer himself in this case. Now, do you know what the Risorgimento is? Does anyone know who, what the Risorgimento is? I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this if you, but do jump in if you want to. It is the cultural and ideological movement that brought the Italian states, uh, the states of the Italian peninsula to unification in 1861. And it's a, a series of different currents, cultural currents, ideological currents, and of course it is a series of wars, of independence wars, um, three in three independence war uh, and uh, the expedition of the 1000 that were all part of uh, um, part of the process of creation of the unified Italian state and the um, um, the annexation of states that were um, previously not part of, of the kingdom of Italy now, the, um, the images of this uh, Risorgimento, one might imagine that, you know, it's, we're talking about wars, we are used to very dynamic images of war, but the technological means were not, uh, were not sufficient at the time to capture action. So the only photographs that survive of this tumultuous era of these wars and of the Risorgimento are images of ruins of the scars that the war left on, uh, on, the terrain, on the territory. This is what we see in these pictures, just ruins, just the effects of the war itself. Stefano Lecchi uh, is the first uh, war reporter, let's put it that way, uh, in Italy. He produced 41 uh, he produced 41 calotype negatives of the ruins of, um, of the Roman Republic of um, 1849. He was not working under commission, as opposed to other very early war reporters, such as Roger Fenton. Uh, he was a self-directed pro-Republican who wanted to convey a message. He wanted to propose an alternative to the uh, classic iconography the repertoires of ancient monuments uh, that we have just seen of this grand to Italy. He wanted to show Italy as a politically unstable terrain where wars are fought and where a sense of nation, of unity, was bringing the people, bringing the people together. However, as I mentioned right at the beginning, when we consider when we consider images we have to look at different uh, sites of the image in rose's words one of the sites is the site of circulation so what scope for circulation could these images have had i mean they were color types so they were fairly easily reproducible but you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to mass produce them in this way. It was not yet the moment of mechanical reproduction or photographer, for instance. The way in which these were reproduced was in lithographs, so prints. But to create a print out of a photograph, you could not do it mechanically or automatically. You would take the picture, outline it, and then put it on, uh, on, on the printing material, etch it, 
and then ink it and print it. Now, this is why, at the time, most of the publications that included photographs were, uh, were said to include lithographs after daguerreotype or after calotype, which gave the impression of objectivity. I mean, after all, they, they, these prints do not come from drawings that suggest the, the subjectivity of the one who is drawing them. They are, they are outlined after daguerreotypes, things that have been um, taken mechanically, objectively, uh, where the subjectivity of the photographer has nothing to do with them. So they suggested this sort of objectivity. But at the same time, of course, the moment you start outlining a daguerreotype, you can manipulate anything. And this is exactly what Danesian Soleil did with Lecky's images. Lecky wanted to distribute those images to show, uh, to show what the, the troops of the Pope did to the short-lived Roman Republic, how they destroyed their own territory uh, to, um, to quench what they considered a rebellion. Danesian Soleil, on the contrary, wanted to show the might of the troops of the Pope and how they heroically uh, maintained the control over, over the land. So they took Lecky's calotypes and etched on top action. Action in the form of the troops of the Pope heroically quenching the rebellion, heroically uh, maintaining control or uh, guarding, um, guarding what remained of, um, of the ruins of Villa Borghese after the occupation um, in their mind, in, in their eyes, um, by the Roman Republic. So it, is, it was a very, very much a double-edged sword, the way in which reproduction of uh, the images couldn't be done mechanically. And at the same time, it shows how much photography is a very modern, very contemporary medium from its very inception. It lends itself to the illusion of objectivity, but also to, a, uh, to an ease uh, of manipulation that makes it the best liar among us, as Sontag uh, called it. So the pictures of the Risorgimento, we have to frustrate the expectation of seeing any action. What we see is mostly the immobility of the effects of the war. But the very protagonist in photographic terms of uh, the Risorgimento is not uh, landscape photography, is not action photography, because there was no such thing as action photography, really. The very protagonist of the Risorgimento is actually the portrait. What, are, what do you think we're looking at? Who do you think we're looking at? Do you recognize this guy? And if you don't recognize him, what do you think we're looking at? Giuseppe Garibaldi. Garibaldi, yes. The Risorgimento. Yes, absolutely. The hero of the Risorgimento, Giuseppe Garibaldi, the, uh, the general that led the expedition of the 1000, La Spedizione dei Mille, from the Kingdom of Piedmont to, down to Sicily to, uh, depending, on who, um, depending on who comments on this, to unify Italy or to just invade, basically, uh, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. But what are we, uh, Garibaldi, spot on, what are we looking at in particular? What, what is this? What are these portraits? Why are they? Where are they? Well, of course, they are in a PowerPoint presentation and they are on your screen at the moment, but they reproduce, they reproduce something. Weren't they um, like part of the Zeets kind of thing? They were collector's cards. Yes. Sorry, I, I I didn't get everything everything that you that you said. They are they were like part of the Z's, the collector's cards for the people to circulate amongst themselves. Yes, exactly. They are card the visit. Exactly. So they are 
a specific type of photograph. And this in particular that we are seeing is um, a page from a private album. Now probably it is uh, it is in a museum. It is in a um, it is it is shown, but originally it was a page of a private collection of images, and that was the point of the carte de visite. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, General Garibaldi. We see a portrait of Garibaldi, portraits of Garibaldi. Garibaldi after being shot in uh, Aspromonte in a hospital bed, and even a sort of pars pro toto. Uh, portrait, the portrait of his boot pierced by a bullet in Aspromonte. So these images in particular are carte de visite. This de Rie patented this in, uh, in France in 1854. It was used extensively initially by his pupil Dodero. They were they were small six by ten centimeters um, images mounted on thick paper that could be taken uh, that could be shot very easily because you would divide um, you would divide a slate of um, a slate of negative in um, about 10 uh, 10 segments you could take you could take a lot of these images. They were cheap to reproduce. Uh, you, you stack them on, um, on on thick cardboard and you had uh, you had the product in your hands and they could be exchanged. So you would go visit someone, a family member, you would give them your card de visite, they would give you their card de visite, and all of a sudden they became such a huge phenomenon that the term cardomania was coined. People started collecting them, started collecting not only the images, the pictures of uh, the, the relatives, uh, the friends, but images of uh, portraits of famous people. And the more reticent they were to have their picture taken, the more valuable these cards, uh, uh, their card de visite were. Um, it was such a huge phenomenon, such a huge mass phenomenon, anti literal of course, that it is estimated that between 1861 and 1867, 300 to 400 million of these card de visites were sold and exchanged hands. And they ended up in private collection. They were collected, traded in albums, like sticker figures, um, fostering a, an approach to images that was soon picked up by the very heroes of the Risorgimento, by Garibaldi himself, by Mazzini uh, in, this, uh, in this image. They understood that this was a thing. Collecting card de visite was a thing. So they started mass producing card de visites of themselves and circulating them. So that people would have in their family albums the pantheon of the heroes of the Risorgimento. They created the, um, the imagery of the Risorgimento, the people who led uh, the unification of Italy. This modern visual currency, as Pellizzari puts it, contributed to create a risorgimento pantheon of statesmen, philosophers, and volunteer soldiers. Mazzini promoted his political body by encouraging a wide circulation of these portraits. In Mito Garibaldino, the, the myth of Garibaldi was created through the circulation of carte visite. It was a huge phenomenon, and, um, and the protagonists of the risorgimento rode the wave of this phenomenon, using it as again, anti-literal, but as a marketing tool, a promotion uh, to promote their image. Last, uh, last image about the Risorgimento and about the portraits of the Risorgimento that I'm going to show you. What do you think we are looking at now? Weren't they the photos of the, well, the rebels, the opposite side that they were circulated? Uh, that's a good, the, that's a good one. I, I was, um, it, it, it's not the case, but I was, I will get there. Uh, I will get there in a moment. 
These were the images of uh, the soldiers involved in the Spedizione dei Mille. And this was in particular a page of the very uh, prestigious album created by Alessandro Pavia, a professional portrait photographer, who took portraits of every single one of the 1,092 uh, participants to the Spedizione dei Mille and collected them in a very carefully bound and packaged tome, 12 portraits per page, recto and verso, uh, so that everyone could take part to the uh, glorious Spedizione dei Mille by collecting the portraits of the soldiers who were involved except that this very elegantly bound tome was inordinately expensive. So people would not really be able to take part to this by just buying it. And therefore, Alessandro Pavia thought of making of it a collection. So he started selling individual pages, individual pictures, empty pages, so that people could start collecting the, the Spedizione dei Mille, much like stickers of our favorite football teams, for instance, uh, the stickers of the, of, of the World Cup, except in, um, in, in a different format, of course. But this, was, this venture was very successful um, for Alessandro Pavia. And what it shows is that photography from its very inception has a very contemporary way of being dealt with and uh, gives, uh, um, gives an impression of modernity from its very outset. It is a very modern um, way of um, form of communication. I'm, I'm going to just skim through these because I'm, I'm quite aware of time. After the 1860s, Italy is unified, travel becomes easier, um, a number of uh, different uh, um, different photographer, including the Fratelli Alinari. Um, the Alinari uh, firm is one of the most important photographic uh, archival agencies in Italy today. Uh, but the Fratelli Alinari started with, uh, uh, with this idea in mind to progressively create a systematic record of Italy's uh, artistic patrimony with uh, the ambition of making it available, uh, available to all, to catalog unified Italy to make a visual catalogue of Unified Italy. And it is in this way, uh, according to Bollati, that the visual dictionary of Italians takes shape. This is how the visual dictionary of Italian is created. People could take part, uh, to, uh, could see what uh, different parts of the newly created, newly unified country were by means of photography and especially by means of people who ventured into the creation of these catalogues, inventories of what it meant to be part of Italy and also what it meant to be Italian. These images are by uh, Giorgio Sommer. I'm going to skip quickly through these. Uh, they are part of a series of Nepolitan types, i tipi napoletani, mangiatori di spaghetti, the spaghetti eaters, the um, Lazzaroni um, time wasters and one of the quintessential orientalist images of the streets of Naples um, it's uh, delicing the delicing of street urchins a number of photographers of the time took this picture it was um, an anti-literum street photography, of course, it had nothing to do with actual street photography because we, these were all studio images recreated in, in, um, in summer studio. But the idea was to uh, catalog alongside Italy itself, its territory, also the people that uh, inhabited it. Photography vastly contributed to the creation of a visual identity of Italy and of the Italians. But of course, every time we think of the creation of a visual identity, the positive creation of a visual identity, we define a margin outside of which there is, though there are those who are different, the others, those that threaten the solidity of the identity itself. 
and uh, Jasmine, I think, was um, was mentioning this when uh, when discussing the um, the Spedizione dei Mille. In to this extent, to who do you think these people are? These guys, the rebels, and the ones that are going against all the governmental proposals yes. and things. Yes, absolutely. These were the rebels. These, in particular, were the brigands. And this uh, this is taken from a pin board in Lombroso's museum in Turin. And it is a collection of portraits, carte de visite portraits of brigands, uh, but also carte de visite portraits of dead brigands, post-mortem photography um, taken as a trophy of the recently captured um, and or executed criminals. Of course, the brigands were a phenomenon of jacquerie, of, um, of rebellion against an, an invading force, but for the Kingdom of Italy, they were classed as criminals, as bands of brigands. This in particular was um, part of a pinboard trophy of captured brigands. It was a very vast phenomenon. I'm not going to dwell too much, on, too much on this, but of course, why it was considered um, by the Kingdom of Italy as a phenomenon of criminality, it was in actual fact a, a, a revolt, a rebellion against, um, against an, invading, an invading force. As a matter of fact, Garibaldi himself resigned in protest the moment um, brigands were declared outlaws and the martial law was, uh, was enforced in the south. So it was, uh, it was a huge phenomenon and a very controversial one. Portraits of these criminals exchanged hands as much as card the visits of the heroes of the Risorgimento and created a, a very vast visual phenomenon that related to brigands. So as much as you had you had in your you could have in your collection a, a portrait of Garibaldi alongside the portrait of your cousin, you could have a portrait of a newly captured brigand, for instance. That was part of the idea of collecting images. Brig images of brigands were taken post-mortem as a trophy, but they were also asked to pose in their last stand before being executed normally. Uh, again, these were used, um, were used mostly for, um, as a trophy because the press wouldn't be able to print uh, images uh, at the time. But brigands themselves understood the importance of images, so they themselves um, posed for portraits and circulated their own carte de visite to create their own visual presence. So much so that some of the, one of them in particular, Antonio Bottoni, here portrayed in a self-portrait that he himself circulated, was actually captured because he was recognized thanks to the vast amount of carte de visite that he had circulated. Otherwise, his physical appearance wouldn't have been known. So it was, photography played a, a very key and complex role also in, in the phenomenon of uh, brigands. Um, Michelina di Cesare, a famous, uh, a famous chieftain of uh, Raffaniello's band, um, captured in, uh, sorry, killed in combat in, in, in 1863, was very much aware of this and she had numerous portraits commissioned uh, by professional studios. She circulated numerous of these portraits and in order to counter the positive um, and amicable appearance that she had created of herself, her captors circulated a post-mortem image where she was after being killed in combat, mutilated and, um, and, and, and was posed naked to see, to show 
um, what I blurred the image because it is rather disturbing, um, because it is um, to show how much the, the power of the state could actually counter the lies in their um, in their in their narrative, the lies that the brigands would um, would bring forth. Now I have one very last slide, which is uh, which is again about the um, the creation of this negative identity of Italians, and of course, when talking about photography, um, about photography in Italy, we have to mention Cesare Lombroso, um, a psychiatrist, well, a psychiatrist, sort of psychiatrist, an alienist, would have been called at the time, who. Um, persuaded himself that criminality uh, has um, a physical component and etches itself, um, derives from physical characteristics and at the same time shows itself on the face and on the physical characteristics of, um, of criminals. Now, this is a, a centuries-old persuasion, it's called physiognomy, and, and he has very long history. Lombroso, however, exploited photography in order to create what he called the atlas of the delinquent man. This was the visual atlas for the perusual, perusual of police officers, for instance, and alienists to ascertain if someone from their appearance could be regarded as a born criminal or just an occasional criminal, for instance, or someone belonging to um, an, an inferior stage of the evolution of human beings and, uh, and, and so forth. So photography is used to create positively the identity of Italians, but also at the same time during the process of unification to create what's outside of the margins of Italians to create uh, um, the image of Italians, but at the same time of th those who threaten the solidity of the identity of the newly created country. Now, I'll, I'll stop here. I've, I've been droning on for quite a bit. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions and go back to the PowerPoint if you want to. Very happy to take comments or questions. Uh, thank you again, Tatiana. Again, thank you for uh, for your presentation. I think that what is also interesting in the line with Lombroso is what happened uh, in the twenties and thirties when uh, um, some photographers and anthropologists went uh, to the colonies, uh, Italian colonies in North Africa and started um, taking pictures of uh, tribes there and cataloged them in the same way, creating this uh, catalog of images uh, uh, with the colors of the skin uh, to show the superiority of the uh, race uh, and the inferiority. So um, yeah, that's a uh, uh, a line that goes from uh, Lombroso till uh, uh, those uh, photographers. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's um, photography plays a key part in um, in in, the, in Italian fascism, both as an instrument of propaganda, but also in terms of uh, Lombrosian theories. After all, the 1920s are the era of um, eugenics and, and the the last, but the most potent uh, revival of the generation theory uh, that will bring about, uh, of course, the, the Nazi and um, the ideas, uh, the ideas they have, that they had about perfecting the race. What, what I think is very, it's very interesting about this is how, uh, how strange somehow the use of photography is in that context. If you, if you think about it, Italy during during fascism um, had a magazine which was called the In Defense of the Race, which was unapol well shamefully and unapologetically uh, um, uh, in, uh, in 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 defense of uh, the racial laws that were passed in, in 1938 in Italy, 
and they would promote uh, the Mediterranean race as a superior race, and the Mediterranean race has absolutely nothing to do with the Aryan stereotype that was promoted by the Nazis. So it, it was very difficult to, um, to use photography as visual confirmation that uh, the race was superior because the description was completely different to the actual average appearance of someone coming from a Mediterranean country. Um, short black haired, uh, black eyes, as opposed to blue eyes, blonde, blonde hair, tall. So yeah, it's very controversial and images, images can be manipulated even, uh, even when they are completely untouched. The way in which we create narratives about them uh, allows, uh, uh, allows people to perceive whatever, uh, whatever is needed at any one time. It, they are a very potent instrument. Would would the card de visite have uh, more writing on, more than just the name of the person? Well, it it depends. Some sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. So, um, for instance, in uh, well, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna share again the screen. For instance, in the Mazzini example, they would just have the name of the person in the Garibaldi ones, they wouldn't even have that, they would have an external caption. Sometimes, um, as was the case in the Pavia, um, in the Pavia um, images of the Spedizione di Milo, they would have a stamp that was the seal of originality, that was the stamp of the author. But in general, there was no way of uh, um, combining the image with uh, um, with anything in writing in a mechanical way you would have to stick something to it or to or to write on it you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be able to print it in the same process so yeah Well, do are there any other questions? Otherwise, um, I'm aware of time. We are uh, we overstepped a bit. I'm gonna write to everyone in the meeting in case you don't. In case you want to contact me, I, I see some some names that I that, that I recognize. Um, Future student of, uh, students of ours, uh, current students of ours. So some some might know me, but in case uh, in case you don't, uh, and you want to just drop me an email with uh, uh, with questions. If you have nagging doubts about this, uh, you can find my um, my email address in the um, in the chat. Otherwise, thank you very much for um, for taking part to this webinar. It was uh, it was a pleasure. To have you here um, and I hope to see you again we'll see you um, albeit only virtually for quite a while I'm afraid um, in class or wherever the uh, wherever there is an opportunity so thank you very much thanks a lot and good night bye bye thank you bye bye Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the meeting now.